G'day and welcome to the AOS Coach sneak peek into the 2022 Eidneth Deepkin Battle Tome. And Games Workshop were very kind to send this to me in advance so I could check out the rules before it goes onto the shelf. And uh, I'm not under any obligation to do this review. Um, they don't get to write or see my scripts or they do, you know, they don't get to see the video before it's released. So uh, know that this is my opinion and I will be looking in this video around the key changes on war scrolls, points changes, grand strategies, and battle tactics. Uh, I mentioned in the last video, which was all about the, uh, the faction rules, that there were no battalions for you. So there are no battalions in your book or the Fire Slayers book that came out at the same time. To avoid making this video too long, as I just mentioned, there is another video that is focused purely on allegiance, sub-allegiance, all the artifacts, command traits, spells, mount traits, all in another video. So go check it out uh, after this video if you haven't already seen it or pause that, uh, pause this one and go see it. In this book, you're going to find a heap of art and narrative gems and path to glory rules and narrative focused content, as well as a great map of Hish. You'll also get a unique code that you'll be able to put into the AOS app so you can get these on the phone as well. There are four extra grand strategies for you to choose from in addition to the ones in your battle pack. The four new ones are Archelian Pursuit, The Creeping Gloomtide, Dominion of the Deep Ones and Nomadi Assault. Archelian Pursuit is scored if there are three or more Archelian units wholly within enemy territory. The Creeping Gloomtide is scored if there are any Gloomtide shipwrecks in your army on the battlefield and all of them are with uh, more than three inches from enemy units. Uh, if you didn't watch the last video or you forgot, there is an ability, I think it was an artifact, that allows you to summon an extra Gloomtide shipwreck, um, so that might combine quite nicely. Dominion of the Old One is scored when there are only monsters on the battlefield and they are friendly Levidons. And then the Nomadi Assault is scored if there are two or more friendly Nomadi units that are within three inches of enemy units, or if the only battle line units on the battlefield are friendly Nomadi. Now, let's assume that we're in a world where I can only choose these grand strategies, because obviously the, the ones that are currently in the General's Handbook 2021 are probably easier to score than these particular ones. But if I had to score one of these ones, it would probably be Creeping Gloomtide. And as I mentioned, I would go in and get that extra artifact to summon the second ship to increase those chances of scoring. Alternatively, I would pick the Archelian Pursuit if I was building around things like sharks, turtles, and eels. There are also six battle tactics for you to choose from in addition to the ones in your battle pack. Assassins of the High Tide is going to need two or more enemy units to be destroyed in this turn by attacks made by friendly Eidolon the Deepkin units that were affected by the High Tide. So really turn three unless you flip the tide for turn two. Predators of the Deep is going to need you to pick one unit from your opponent's starting army that's on the battlefield that has a wounds characteristic of eight or more and has no wounds allocated to it. Then you're going to score this battle tactic if you kill it with an Alapex unit. Revenge of the Nomadi is going to need a Nomadi unit to destroy an enemy hero or monster. Deny Trespasses is going to need you to defend a Gloomtide shipwreck that started your turn with enemy units within 12 inches. And then you're going to want to kill those units that are within 12 inches. So units started near the Gloomtide, you kill them. There's no units within 12. Happy days, you score it. Trapped under the undercurrents is going to need three or more friendly item the deep kin units to have retreated and made a charge move during this turn. Then finally, the Ishran Defiance is going to require you to pick one objective that is wholly within enemy territory, and you're going to score it if you control that objective and there is a friendly Ishran unit within six inches of the objective. So obviously all, all good depending on how you're building your list and what the situation is on the tabletop, but it's great to have these six flexible options uh, that you can pull out during the game. Now let's talk about the changes that have happened on War Scroll, and there is a fair amount of changes that have happened. Some are only minor, there are minor boosts or minor uh, debuffs 
or there are some big, big changes that have happened on the War Scroll. So I'm going to try to call out as many of them as possible, starting with the Eidolon of Mathlan, the aspect of the storm. Now, it was updated during Broker Realms Marathi, and you will notice that the move, save, bravery, and wounds characteristic is the same to what was in Broken Realms Marathi. Your melee profile is still the same. So is the Storm Shawl, the Crashing Upon the Foe. Those two abilities still remain the same. The first ability that changed here was the Drench with Hate, and that bubble is now a 12 inch bubble. It used to be 18 inches, and the bubble, should you be wholly within it, would give you a plus one to wound rolls for friendly Eidmoth Deepkin units. The other major change that happened is the pulled into the depths. That is now a plus one to hit and a plus one to wound. It used to be a plus one to hit against one enemy hero with eight wounds or less, or with that we were in three inches. There was some bizarreness, but it sounds like it was a good buff. Uh, you're now just doing a plus one to hit and a plus one to wound. On the other side of the fence, our wizardy aspect, uh, it has gained a plus two to its move. So it's now movement 12 and then it's uh, save, it's bravery, and it's wounds still stay the same. Blast of Abyssal Energy has lost some range, so it used to be 15 inches, it lost three inches of range, and it's now down to a 12 inch shooting attack. The profile is still the same, it's just a shorter range. Um, much like the aspect of the Storm, the Storm Shoal uh, has stayed the same, uh, and the Cloying Sea Mist spell has still stayed the same. One of the changes was Dormant Energies, and what that now does is it allows you to re-roll your casting, dispelling, and unbinding roll. And if you were successful in casting any spells in your hero phase, you can heal up to D3 wounds allocated to the Eidolon uh, at the end of the phase. Now, I believe that used to have a similar set of rules in the old book, but you would only heal if you didn't do a re-roll. So uh, it was obviously, you don't re-roll, you get to heal. But in this case, it looks like you get to um, have your cake and eat it too and do both of them. There is another change in Tranquility of the Abyss. It is slightly reworded, but it is mostly the same outcome. So instead of getting a plus three bravery to friendly IDK units that were wholly within 18 inches of this model, it is now a flat 10 bravery. The other change that I noticed was the Tsunami of Terror. It's the same cast and the same range that it used to be, but it's now only D3 enemy units where it used to be D6. If you're successful in casting it, it is a subtract one from the save rolls for melee units instead of the minus one to hit and minus one bravery. So uh, the, the number of units that are affected has reduced, but also uh, the, the ability now has changed as well. Next on the pad is Volturnus, and our named Archelian King has a same movement save wounds characteristic, but it has gained plus two to its bravery, so now it's a flat 10. The Astral Solace has lost an attack. It has gained a point of rend. It is flat three damage now, so the profile looks like four attacks, hits on threes, wounds on threes, rend minus two for three damage. Um, there are other attacks on there, um, they seem to have mostly stayed the same, except the Fangs and Talons now does D3 damage. Volturnus has lost the Crest of the High King. The um, Seleneth of the High King Shield and the Deepmere Horn have stayed the same. One of the changes is the first amongst Archelians, which no longer re-rolls ones, and it has a shorter range. And so it's down to range 12, and when you use first among Archelians, you get to add one to the hit rolls for attacks made by melee weapons by friendly Archelian units, now excluding the mount, you don't get the plus one to hit for mounts, that are wholly within 12 inches of this unit. The other change is the Supreme Lord of Tides, and that ability is once per battle, at the start of the combat phase, you can pick up to three different friendly Eidolon Deepkin units that are affected by the High Tide ability from the Tides of Death. And if they're wholly within 12 inches of this unit, you get to add plus one to the attack characteristics of melee weapons used until the end of that phase. So really still focused on doubling down in that turn three or turn two if you flip the Tides, using the first strike, getting the extra attacks, doing as much damage as possible in that predictable high tide ability. For our non-named Archelian King, the move, save, wounds are still the same, and much like Volturnus, the bravery is now up to flat 10, so you've gained another two points of bravery. 
There are minor changes across the melee profile, with probably the biggest being the, an extra attack on the greatsword, uh, it being a 2 plus 2 wound and a flat 2 damage on the bladed polearm as well. So there's a couple of changes, whether it's the greatsword or the polearm. You did lose the Storm of Blows ability. One of the big changes for the Archelian King is going to be the Lord of Tides, and that no longer gives you plus 1 attack um, under high tide. Instead, what it does is once per battle at the end of the charge phase, you can pick up to D3 different friendly Deepkin units wholly within 12 inches of that Archelian King. And if you do so until the end of that turn, the unit is going to be affected by high tide, so strike first, in addition to any other abilities that it's receiving from high tide. So if you happen to be in low tide and you apply this Lord of the Tides, you would get the ability on those D3 units to have, I don't know, high tide and low tide, or ebb tide and high tide, whatever combination you might apply it. But either way, you get to use multiple uh, parts of the Tides of Death. The other key change that I noticed is the Archelian Paragon, and that is now going to add plus one to the hit rolls for attacks made by melee weapons of friendly Archelian units, excluding their mounts that are wholly within nine inches of the unit. So uh, a nice couple of little boosts there, especially again, talking about preparing for the high tides. The last one would be the Wave Rider, and that's changed as well. Now, I really like this, and we'll explain in a second why I really like it. But the Wave Rider, basically, with the pole arm, so if you take the bladed pole arm attack, um, you get to change the characteristic to Ren 3 and Damage 3 if you make a charge move in that same turn. So Ren 3, Damage 3 can be quite nasty. And really what it allows you to do, when I looked at the Archelian King, it's a great hero. I really like this because it can be created quite defensively. He has a three up armor save and there's some interesting armor like the, is it the armor of Synthai, um, make it even more defensive. Or if you wanted to make a more aggro offensive build, you know, you've already got one, the what I just talked about, the Ren 3 damage three wave rider charge. And then you could talk about the, uh, the potion of the Hatefield Fury, that plus one to hit, plus one to wound, plus one charge, plus one everything, that once per battle potion. So uh, either way, I really like the Archelian King. I expect to see it in a lot of lists. The Ishran Tidecaster has the same move and wounds characteristic as it used to. However, it now has a flat four up armor save and the bravery is up to eight. The Riptide spell is the same, however, you've lost the Spirit Guardians and the Wide Ether Sea, and the Wide Ether Sea is probably going to hurt a little bit, because that's how you used to be able to flip the tides in the old book. If you want to flip the tides, I think the only way you can do it is that command trait that we spoke about in the last video, and expect to see these Gifts of the Depths um, a lot, because you've gained that as well as Masters of the Ether Sea, and what Gifts of the Depths do is gives you a five up ward save so a bunch of your heroes actually have this so you'll be running around with a whole bunch of five up wards now the master of the ether sea if if any of these units has this ability and obviously the ishran tidecaster is one of those you get to pick two of the different ishran rituals to influence the ether sea during uh the battle instead of one so uh in the last video we did show off the ishran rituals if you want a bit of a refresher but instead of getting only one of those ishran rituals you'd get two of them because of the master of the ether sea which um, is pretty cool the ishran soul renders move and wounds uh, has remained the same and it now also has a flat four up armor save and its bravery is also eight the melee profile is now four attacks with that hook the serrated bill has a consistent three attacks as well uh, much like the ishran tidecaster it also has the gifts gifts of the depths which is a five up ward um, the lure light is the same it has been slightly reworded it's the same effect um, but at the end of the battle shock phase, you pick one friendly Nomadi unit wholly within 18 of this unit, and you get to return D3 slain models to that unit. You get to return a flat three models to that unit. Instead, if the uh, the Talon hook um, had killed uh, a, a model in the same turn. So it can't be affected by the lure light ability more than once per turn. So you can't stack and get, you know, six, nine Nomadi back. But um, again, same, same, but, you know, some slight differences. The other change is going to be in the Hangman's Knot, which is a once per battle at the end of the combat phase, 
you can pick one enemy model that has a wound characteristic of seven or less if it doesn't have a mount trait and is within three inches of this model you roll 2d6 if the roll is greater than the enemy model's wounds characteristic it is just flat slain the Ishran Soul Scry's move and wounds is the same and also has a 4-up armor save and bravery 8. The missile weapon has changed. It is a shorter range. It's now 12 inches, but it has a better attack profile. It hits on a 2, it wounds on a 4, rend 1 for 1 damage. You have lost the Seeker of Souls ability and what's changed is the finder of the ways basically it's the same ability it allows you to put two units in reserve but when you deploy those units they do need to be within nine inches of this unit instead of 12. however there is one command trait or one artifact um, that allows you to do this so if you still want it to be 12 inches there is a way through the customization to make it a 12 inch um coming from reserve bubble otherwise if you, you don't change it then it's only nine inches and it's also gained the gifts of the depth which is a five up ward there are no changes from the original war scroll so i'm not going to repeat myself here however if this is new to you and you haven't seen the war scroll um go check out the fury of the deep video on this channel and you'll see a deeper dive into the full profile of the archelian thrall master the one that I'm most excited to talk about is Lotan because a lot of people have been waiting for a time that Lotan becomes good. And I think I can safely say that Lotan is now worth at least exploring. In the past, Lotan was there for lols. Now it's actually got some interesting rules. And um, first off, the move and the wounds is still the same, uh, although the save now is four and the bravery is eight. The uh, bone quill attack has slightly been improved. And Oki or Octa's attacks are consolidated into eight attacks. It used to have like, was it six, two, and two, or there was some weird combination of attacks. It's now just a flat six, uh, eight attacks under a single profile. The catalog of souls has changed, and what it now does is add one to the wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons by friendly IDK uh, units that are wholly within 12 inches of this unit. So that's pretty good considering how hard it is to get a buff onto a wound roll. Um, it'd be a nice way to get your melee weapons buffed up. It also still has a five up ward save. Um, it gained a ability called Fount of the Willpower. And what Fount of the Willpower does is once per battle, if this unit's on the battlefield at the start of the hero phase, you can pick one ritual from the Ishran rituals table and one friendly IDK unit wholly within 12 inches of this unit. Until the end, uh, until the next hero phase, that unit uh, that you picked will be able to be affected by the, the ritual as well as any other rituals that are going to be affected. So a nice little boost again when you looked at those, was it four? I think it was four rituals you can pull from. Uh, an alternative if you don't have that soul scryer. Um, or you're going to be able to get three of the four, so not too bad. The last of the heroes, unfortunately, I ran out of time before I had to record this video, so I'm going to leave you to explore it and have a look to see exactly how that soul raid does work out. Um, I did see there was like a five up ward and there's a six up ward in the unit, but what it does and how it justifies the points increase, spoiler alert, um, I'll leave it up to you to work out if it's actually a valuable um, addition to your force. Looking at the troops, you've got your Ishlan Guard and obviously your Morsard Guard will follow from here. Looking at the Ishlan Guard, your move, save, wounds characteristic remain the same, but the bravery is now seven. The eel attack has been simplified. It's now three attacks, hitting on threes, uh, wounding on threes, rend one for D3 damage. Um, it used to have this separate two inch random attack profile um, that tail profile is no longer there it's just a consolidated eel attack your champion still gets plus one attack the uh, standard bearer and the musician no longer provide uh, those various re-rolls i think there was a re-roll battle shock and maybe it was re-roll charge uh, instead what happens is the uh, standard bearer adds plus one to the bravery and the musician adds plus one to the uh the charge rolls now that bio barrier is still going to ignore positive and negative ren characteristics and it's still going to make the unit a three up armor save if it's made a charge in the same turn 
And looking at the Morsar guard, it has the same move, same save, same wounds characteristic, and its bravery 2 is 7. Um, it also has that simplified eel attack, hitting on 3s, wounding on 3s, Ren 1 for D3 damage. It also lost that random 2-inch uh, tail attack. Again, very similar. The Champion, Musician, and Standard Bearer uh, are exactly the same as what I shared with the Ishlan guard. Um, the Wave Rider ability... Um, has has stayed the same, so it's still going to boost the um, the Vault Spears rend and damage if you charge. Finally, what's changed is your little Zappy Zappy, and that is once per battle after this unit has made a charge move, you can say that it's going to unleash its energy. And if you do so, you pick one enemy unit that is within one inch of this unit, and you roll a dice equal to the number of models in the unit. For each four up, that enemy is going to suffer one mortal wound. For each six, it is going to suffer D3 mortal wounds. Now, you do get to add plus one to that roll if the number of models in that unit is greater than the amount of models in the eel unit. So if you've got a unit of three, if you go into a unit of five, you get plus one to that. So not too bad if you want to get your little zappy zappy. You haven't lost it. It has slightly changed, though. Now, I have already covered the changes to the Nomadi Thralls and the Nomadi Reavers in the Fury of the Deep video. Again, go check that video out if you want to see um, a more in-depth look at the Thralls and the Reavers. But in a nutshell, the Nomadi Thralls have a range 2-inch weapon. When you target a model with a wounds characteristic of 3 or more, you do get to add 1 to the damage. Uh, and that is lowered from the previous requirement. It used to be uh, on, a, on a model with four wounds. It's now down to three. Um, nothing has changed if you attack a model with one wound. Your Nomadi Reavers have had a modification to the Whisper Bow, and that shooting attack has been consolidated. And the shooting profile has generally probably improved overall. It does have a better hit and better wound. It, has a, uh, it gains some rend. But there is no option for doing those three attacks within a nine inch range. Although there is an ability on the Namadi Reavers called the Ripples of the Ether Sea that does add one to the hit rolls for attacks made by missile weapons if the target is within nine inches of the attacking models. The other thing with the Reavers to call out is that it did lose the Swift Tide ability that would allow them to re roll their run rolls. Now, the Achillean Leviathan was updated in Broken Realms Marathi. The move, save, bravery, and wounds remains the same. The missile weapon profile is the same. The melee profile is the same, except the twin prong spear is now rend minus one. The jaws of death is the same. The void drum is the same. But the other change that comes out of the Leviathan is the crushing charge. It used to just do D3 to D6 mortal wounds, I think, on the charge. Instead, in its replace, it's a uh, if you carry out this stomp monstrous rampage with this unit and the enemy has a wounds characteristic of 1, that enemy unit's going to suffer D6 mortal wounds on a 2 plus instead of D3, assuming they didn't have Hunters of the Heartland. Now, Alapexes were updated in Fury of the Deep, so I'll call out some of those key changes, but as per the Namadi video, if you want a deeper explanation to the changes to the Alapexes, I would highly recommend go checking out that video. But uh, it is battle line under Futhan, so you could go and double reinforce this unit. If you decide to reinforce the Sharks to have two or more models, you would gain access to a Shark Champion, and uh, it would create some new coherency rules. So the sharks would be coherent if they were within three inches of each other uh, instead of one. So if you have seen the Storm Drake Guard, this, the Stormcast Dragons, it's the same rule. You know, you can have a coherency within three inches rather than one inches. There is a ability called the Bloodthirsty Predators, and that has a, improved the range out to be six. So. Uh, if you do have Bloodthirsty Predators, um, you get to add plus one to the attack characteristic of the Ferocious Bite. If it's within six inches of an enemy model that's had either wounds allocated to them, or if the enemy unit has had a model slain that turn. So you get a nice little boost for doing some killing. They get some blood in the water. And then finally, those Sharkies have gone up to uh, plus two wounds. So... They were on, I think it was eight wounds. They are now 10 wounds uh, in peace. So that will change some things around, uh, especially like cover. Um, but ultimately, an extra two wounds is a nice little thing to have for your little combat monsters. 
The other change is the melee weapon profile. Um, the harpoon launcher is now a D3 as opposed to, uh, I think it was a 1 from memory. Now there's plenty of movement when it comes to the points and there'll be no surprise to see all these boosts have come at a cost because a lot of things have gone up. The Leviathan's going up to 500 points means that I can't run all of my Ninja Turtles unless Games Workshop want to throw me a White Dwarf supplement where I can make one of the Turtles a hero. Um, there are plenty of small changes, 20 and 30 points changes, whether it's you know the Eidolon, the uh, Achillean King, the Soul Render, the Ishlan Guard, the Lotan, and uh, the Tidecaster all went up 40 points. You'll notice that the Morsar Guard and the Ishlan Guard are now the same points. Um, and it'll be interesting now to see that that you know because you know one of the eels the uh, the the Ishlan guard used to be 155 points. They used to be a steal. Now that Morsa and Ishlan are the same price, how does that change the mix with eels? Or you know, are we going to drop some of the eels for something else? Um, you'll notice that those three bloodthirsty um, sharks, the Futhan unit is uh 495 points so it does give you three individual sharks so that will meet your battle line requirement at 2000 points but overall you'll see um the the soul raid that um the underworld's warband has gone up to 65 point up 65 points not to 65 points i wish or you wish maybe uh the archelian king has gone up 20 points you know the tide cast is up 45 the soul renders up 30 low tans up 40 but I think low 10 now deserves it. So uh, kudos to you. You've earned your, your, your points increased. But all as always, the true list tech is really going to come out when they are FAQ'd. Hopefully there's not a lot of FAQs and it comes out pretty quickly, but that will normally trigger a lot of the conversations, especially on my channel, um, to see what it actually looks like now that they're FAQ'd and, and tournament legal. But... When I look at the original IDK book that came out many, many moons ago, feels like it came out around the same time as uh, black and white television, it certainly has held up incredibly well, considering it was a first edition book. You know, it always was competitive, whether it was through eels or eels uh, or eels, you know, you're always competitive in the meta in first edition and in second edition. Um, what I like probably most about this book is that it has unlocked a heap of varieties when it comes to list building. You know, previous tournament lists, if you were following the meta at the time, they all usually felt the same. There'd be minor tweaks, but ultimately they would feel the same. But, you know, you'll now see, in my opinion, you'll see competitive Nomadi builds. I think Nomadi with their two inch range and some whole bunch of boosts now. There's a whole bunch of buffs that are tying to Nomadi. I think you'll see some interesting builds and really go well right now with the monster meta. You will still see competitive Archelian lists, whether it's through eels or whether it's through sharks. Although I don't know how well a full shark list would compete right now, but man, that would be a lot of fun. And also a, a total list having like three turtles would be bloody hilarious. I don't know how well that would hold up. It would certainly need something like mightier is rightier on an objective i don't know if having three turtles running around the board would actually win you a couple of games but look there are plenty of interesting rules that i think are worth exploring and i'm really interested to see how they play on the tabletop because you know i probably could see a whole bunch of um, eidolons on the table and maybe for the first time we'll see those wizard eidolons again it's probably i don't think i've ever played against the aspect of the sea I think it's always been an aspect of the storm that I've always played against. So I'm hoping to see more wizard eidolons on the table. And hopefully, finally, uh, Lotan and Oki are going to finally be worth taking and putting into your um, into your, your table. But hey, underwater elf friends, I would love to know in the comments section, what did you think about the Battle Tome updates? Were you happy that you weren't slanished? Were you sad that you weren't Beast of Chaos? You know, let me know in the comment section what you think about the changes. How has it changed maybe some of your list design? Is there some artifacts or some command traits that you really like? Is flipping the tide still important to you? Will you be going for that particular command trait? Or is there something that the Archelians or the, or the Eidolons is going to draw you to? Look, let me know in the comments. I'd be curious to hear. And as I mentioned, there is another video that focuses on the faction rules and 
there will be a number of discussions. I've already got a couple of people in mind. They'll be reaching out to post FAQ to talk about how their new competitive lists are going to look with their new battle tome. Thanks for sticking around until the end. I hope you found that video interesting and you walked away with a few new ideas. If you did, I would appreciate it if you hit like on the video as well as left me a comment. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. The conversation will continue over on Discord, so links down below in the episode description if you want to join the Discord and continue the Age of Sigmar conversation. I want to give a massive shout out as well to these absolute bloody legends, these champions who have continued to support me through Patreon or YouTube members. That is going directly into supporting the maintenance and the growth of this channel. So thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. And until next time, roll more sixes.